Chris, what I, I really think mostly about hope is the concept that people have of making things better. What are you hoping for? It's always the hope to make something better. There's a, a very famous quote that I like that I'll say it in English, but it comes from the philosophies of the rabbis of the Bible from thousands of years ago. And it says, it's not up to you to finish the job, but you're not allowed to walk away from it. And I think it's such an important concept that we're not all going to be the most successful. We won't all be the richest or the best looking or have the greatest this or the greatest that. And we're not going to live in a world that's perfect. That's just the way it is, right? There's all sorts of problems every day and there always will be. But it's our job to work on improving the situation. And by seeing how you can make things better, I think that's what hope is all about. And don't ever run away from the task of trying to make things better. Hi, I'm Doug Goldstein. I'm a fan of I Share Hope. And enjoy the show. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Well, Doug Goldstein joining us today. I am thrilled with this because I have a financial background, used to be a certified financial planner, which Doug is also. Doug is way more qualified than I ever was and licensed all over the place here in the U.S. and overseas. He is currently in Israel and does a lot of work with expatriates from the U.S., helping them navigate that crazy world of finance and taxes, etc. overseas. He's written several books. His newest one, Rich as a King, is really, really interesting because it's financial and strategy, and he's co-authored with Susan Polgar, who was and still is one of the best champion chess players in the world. So Doug is really fascinating on I Share Hope today, not because I know anything about some crazy background piece he has that just makes it a true hope story, but because he delivers hope every day to clients. But we'll hear a little more about his personal life as well as we go. So Doug, a little more about you. Chris, wow, thanks so much for the, uh, for the introduction. I'm sure you were a fabulous CFP in your day as well. Uh, about me. So I started actually on Wall Street about 20 years ago. I was partners then, and my partner was my mother. My mother was one of what uh, was a vice president at a company called Dean Witter, which sure. now subsequently became Morgan Stanley, and then now is just Morgan Stanley. <clears throat> so we were partners there together, and uh, it was great because one of the things that uh, that I think I learned most from working with her was the importance of educating people. You know, everyone likes to believe you go work on Wall Street that somehow all of a sudden you get prophecy. But I'm telling you, I, even though I went to work with the Bible, it didn't help. And, <laughs> and uh, I have no idea what the markets are going to do. And, you know, no one can predict that. But, uh, but educating people was really critical. And one day I asked my mother, I said, Mom, you know, where did you get this model of dealing with clients? And, and she smiled and she reminded me that her mother, my grandmother, was one of the first women to be licensed as a stockbroker in America. No so way. So definitely, uh, yeah, runs in the family. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, I'm that's the, doing that's that 20 plus years already. Doug, getting a little, uh, we got a little sketchy on the Sorry, audio. Sorry, I say that once more. Okay. Got, you've said something 20 something years. Yeah. Try that again. So I've been doing this now, working kind of the same thing that I started over 20 years ago, which is educating clients about how to handle their money and helping them to, to take care of it. Wow. That's great. So personally, and, and books, author, I mean, you've got a lot going on besides just this financial practice. You've got a huge YouTube following and a podcast that's new and noteworthy right now called Rich as a King. You're a busy guy. That's right. I, I really like the teaching thing. I, I do the, uh, the financial stuff because that, that pays the bills, but... Uh, yeah, I really put the two of them together, and I've enjoyed writing. I probably also got that from my mother, who was a, a published author as well. And uh, I, I like to try and bring new ideas together. The, the most recent book that I wrote called Rich as a King, How the Wisdom of Chess Can Make You a Grand Master of Investing, mm. is a book that I wrote with a co-author, a fascinating woman. Maybe we'll get to talk about her a little bit. It, but it's really about teaching people, not about chess, but about bringing strategy into all the ways that they think. In the same way I like to think about, I don't know if you know, the, the Tim Ferriss wrote a number of great books. Yeah. And he wrote The 4-Hour Chef. And uh, I heard him interview this. They said, well, you know, why'd you write about being a chef? And he laughed. He goes, the book's not about being a chef. The book is about deconstructing ideas and, and realizing how you can learn. And I think that's so important. You can learn a lot of 
new ideas by taking old ideas, hmm. bringing them together. You know, I think that's so true. I read a lot, as I'm sure you do, and I hear things, read things all day long that I've heard a million times before, but one new person putting it in a new way and, and explaining it differently makes it stick. So I'm glad you're doing all this. Thanks for your time. All so right, thank you. you know how the interview works. We have five questions about hope and you can answer them however you would like. This is about you and your version here, not mine, not anybody else's. So question one is your definition of hope or your favorite quote about hope. Chris, what I, I really think mostly about hope is that the, the concept that people have of making things better. You know, when we say, what are you hoping for? It's always the hope to make something better. And uh, th there's a, a very famous quote that I like that I'll say it in English, but it comes from kind of the philosophies of the rabbi of rabbis of the of the of the Bible from thousands of years ago. And it says, it's not up to you to finish the job, but you're not allowed to walk away from it. Hmm. And I think it's such an important concept that you know, we're not all going to be the most successful. We won't all be the richest or the best looking or have the greatest this or the greatest that. But, and we're not going to live in a world that's perfect. That's just the way it is, right? There's all sorts of problems every yeah. day and there always will be. But it's our job to work on improving the situation. And, and hmm. by seeing how you can make things better, I think that's what hope is all about. And don't ever run away from the task of trying to make things better. Wow, that's a great perspective. It really is, because it takes into account the reality that it's not going to be the best day always. We hope we get a lot more of them, but you really have to take this thing by the horns and wrestle it down and, and do good for somebody else and for yourself. That's great. Okay, who has been the strongest leader of hope in your life? Who's impacted you the most with hope? Um, now, I said before I would talk to you a little bit about my co-authors. I, I want to tell a story that uh, that actually happened to her yeah. and because it really had an impact when I heard her talk about it. Just recently, right. she and I were in Switzerland. We were doing our book tour, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very exciting. We got uh, ex invited to a, uh, a money management conference in a beautiful town over, looking over Lake Geneva. Wow. And I was speaking about behavioral finance, but she told her story, which is, which is amazing. And I just want to tell you one little bit of the story, which I, I think maybe will answer the question. So Susan Polgar was born in communist Hungary. And for guys like you and me, we're so used to just you know, doing the things the way we want to do and freedom and, mm -hmm. and our parents could school us wherever and however they wanted, but we take so much for granted. And her father was kind of a radical psychologist for the of the day. And he had this theory that genius could be learned. And it wasn't just that you were naturally or genetically a genius. And he wanted to prove it with his own kids. So he wanted to homeschool his children. Yeah. So imagine you go to you know the communist government who has uh, one way of doing things, which is their way, and no. you say, you know, I've decided not to send my kids to your school. I'm going to teach them at home, and I'm going to teach them whatever I feel like. And it didn't go so didn't go so well for them in the beginning. But he was so insistent. He really had the the drive and the hope to see this through, and he did. And ultimately, his three daughters became super world champions. They became the Polgar sisters because of his dedication. Wow. And I think, you know, when I, when I hear a story like that about a parent who is, doesn't stop hmm. until he gets what he wants for his kids, I think it's, I don't mean being nasty, I just mean being dedicated to your children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I heard that story, I thought back of a story with, with uh, one of my own kids when she was in school and a great student, the sweetest sweetest kid. I mean, I know all parents say that, but she's really, really sweet. <laughs> and uh, she was like crying every night about school and it just didn't make any sense. And, you know, for the first few nights, we just kind of said, oh, you know, it'll get better and don't worry and, you know, just listen to the teacher. And, and after a while, my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said, you know, let's listen a little more closely. Hmm. And uh, it turned out that the teacher was kind of a nut and my daughter was really suffering, mm. and she didn't know how to express it because she was little at the time. And so she couldn't quite express it. But uh, it was at that point, we, so we took her out of class and solved the problem. But uh, we realized you have to go, go for it with your kids because your kids, you know, the whole point of today's discussion is about hope. Yeah. Where are they going to learn that unless they see that their parents and their family structure is the one that's going to give them hope? You're right. 
Ooh, that's great stuff. That's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. So in your, in your world, your life, when is one of those times, tell us a story when hope has been and some really all you had to fall back on and, um, tell us the, the story, give us the time, set the stage. How does this look? Chris, I got to tell you, I think you're not going to be so happy with my answer because I spent a long time thinking of this one. And uh, <laughs> it was driving me a little bit crazy because I was thinking, you know, I, it, it's like when people tell me, how did you get through, you know, really awful time in your business, right? When mm -hmm. things totally collapsed, you know, major failure. Mm -hmm. I was on this great, uh, great show, which I really love called Entrepreneur on Fire. It is a great show hosted by a guy named John Lee Dumas and I love him and I love his show and I, and I had the honor to be a guest and uh, when he asked that question I had to go back to when I was 15 years old to find a major failure not because I didn't have problems but because I, I always try to really plan things out incredible I'm a big planner yeah. right? I, I'm not just a financial planner but I plan everything and uh, so I you know, I couldn't give him an answer you know, to his question well like you know nine months ago we had this major failure because we don't because <laughs> we try to set things up we're always thinking of the failures and try to avoid them. So, uh, to answer your question about when was it that things were so, you know, it's so fallen apart that the only thing I had was hope, I, I was beginning to think why I couldn't answer that question. And I think the answer is, and, and you know, and the, the point of encouragement here, especially for parents mm -hmm. is, um, and friends, if you surround with either good friends or you have someone in the family or you know your rabbi or your priest or your or your god and you say um, I've got someone here with me hmm. then you're not alone right and then oh. you, it's not you don't need the hope as the only thing you can hold on to you can hold on right you're gonna hold on to your to your to your brother whoever it is and uh, it's building those relationships, which is what we should all be always investing money in these emotional relationships so that when we do need the help, mm -hmm. you know, and you take a little withdrawal from that account, you know, there's still plenty there. Oh, I love it. And that keeps coming up as a theme with people we're interviewing. Even if you don't have this heartbreak story and your car flipped over the same day you lost your job and then your house burnt down when you got home and you realized <laughs> a, a squirrel killed your dog, whatever it may be, the... <laughs> The relationships are what it comes back to every time. It's always the relationships, every stinking time. And, and it's the strength that you build either today, even if today's a hard day, or decades in advance that we take for granted before we have a hard time. Those relationships are so important. I think that's a great answer. If you said that, I was really concerned I'd fail. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, Doug, you failed on the podcast. You didn't give us a good answer. Well, there you go. Now you have a good failure story, right? <laughs> no. no, that was a perfect answer. That's what I'm looking for, the real deal. It's not a, it's not a fake show. All right, let's go for question number four. How are you sharing hope to others today? So you're reaching a large audience on a lot of different platforms and probably ways that none of us even know that you might have just said hi and given a smile to a guy walking down the street today. How are you sharing hope to people around you? Well, first of all, I do hope that I give smiles to people. I, I do try, so uh, <laughs> I'm happy with that. You know, I think that um, I'll bring it to the business side of it because I do spend a lot of time in my business, both in writing as well as, you know, actually just talking to, to I think that what people really need to have is is feeling that, that they're going to be able to succeed. And when... Uh, you know, we can talk on all levels, but let's just talk the most common thing that I deal with as a financial planner is, will I be able to retire one day? And that's a huge fear. And frankly, a lot of people are not able to, to do it, and certainly not the way that they expected they would. But I think that the way that I'm able to help them is by giving them the education they need to understand where they are now and where they're going to be. And sometimes you do that by putting together a financial plan, which you know, I, I do a lot of work for, to make the plan for clients, but frankly, I think it's more for me than for them. It's so that I can then explain to them not only that they'll be all right, but how they'll be all right. And when you show someone a path, they, they still have to follow the path. You know, I can't do it for them. They have to set their budget and do their investing, right? I mean, I can help them along the way, but, uh, but they've got to do it themselves. But then you've given someone the path to follow, and, and, and he knows it's going to be okay. And that kind of education, again, I goes back to what my mother showed me about the way she she took care of her clients and whether I do it in writing or you know in podcasts or face-to-face or -face, I hope I, I really do hope I'm able to help people that way 
I think you are, and you're setting yourself up, man. You better be able to answer question number five really well. I, I am a big guy and a big fan of action. Not a big guy. I'm a big fan of action when it comes to anything in life. If I can't take action on it, I can't figure out what to do with it. And hope is way more important to me than most things in life right now. And I want to know how I can take action on hope. So what are the steps, the, the A, B, C, the one, two, three that you say, Chris, if you want to start using hopeful passion influence in yourself, others, what do I do? Where do I start today? If I'm, if I'm getting started on this journey. So I don't have one, two, three, I have one, hey, <laughs> I yeah. have one thing. I'm going to make it simple, but I, I'm going to, I got to give you a little background because otherwise uh, maybe you won't. I need to get a little buy-in from you before I, I tell you. <laughs> okay, great. So about, uh, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, I was at a, uh, a conference for a big company called IDT, which is a telecommunications company. Mm -hmm. And the fellow who ran the company was a guy named Howard Jonas. He gave a long speech. And, uh, frankly, I don't remember anything about the speech. One thing. He said, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, he wasn't a really dynamic speaker. He just kind of stood there and said it out. But just, it really stuck. He said, my wife and I, we give to charity 20% of everything we earn. And I remember thinking, 20%? Wow. Wow. And I said, I want to be like him. This is when I was a lot younger and I wasn't, didn't quite have as big a, you know, an enterprise as I have now. And I went home to my wife that day and I said, uh, I said, I heard this guy, Howard Jonas, and he was pretty cool. And well, let's do what he does. Hmm. And so we started giving 20% of what we earned to charity. That's huge. That's, yeah, that's you know, the average in America, it's somewhere around 1%. Yeah. And in Europe, it's a fraction of a percent. It's the, wow. the people in Europe are not, not big into charity. Mm -hmm. There's a whole philosophy behind why that is, but not relevant. But this is like a huge change. A lot of people tithe, right? Mm -hmm. And they give 10%. Um, but this was a big, big step up. And so I'll tell you why I think this is so important. It, there's, it's sort of funny for me to say because I'm in the money business, but money really messes people up, right? Mm -hmm. the, the richest right. people, you know, I know when they, when they don't do it the right way, they're messed up, their kids are messed up, their grandkids are messed up, everything's messed up. But people, the, the most successful people I've met are people who also give 20%. I began noticing that in my ultra high net worth clients. Hmm. These guys were given, you know, 20% or more. And they always would say to me, you know, when things go bad, I always increase my charity and it gets better. And they would quote me, there's a passage in the Bible that talks about this. You know, you're not allowed to test God, right? Yeah. You're not allowed to run in front of a truck and say, God, if you love me, you know, you'll save me, right? <laughs> but, uh, but specifically, it says in the Bible, God says, listen, Give charity and you'll get back more. You know, and he says, test me on this. Wow. So it's very interesting, right? And I don't really, I'm no biblical scholar and I don't know what this wow. really means. Yeah. But, but you're I seeing think, a trend. You've got the data in front of you. Yeah. And you know what's even more important than that? If I'm wrong, what's the worst case, right? The worst case is you, were, you gave other people hope. And, you know, I, I always imagine if you have food on the table every day, Right, and you have a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. th there's a billion people on the planet who don't have that. Wow. Right, so you've made the bare minimum, and now it's time to go help other people. And it bugs me when people say, oh, "I can't afford it," and you know they're driving, you know, their the car, and they mm -hmm. got a 80 inch TV. You know, you got you got to give back. And I've never ever met someone who said, "Geez, I gave too much money in charity, and now I'm having financial problems." Never seen that. That's a great step for sharing hope i love yeah. that nobody's mentioned that yet thank you very much yeah. really good one 20 percent of your income that would put a cramp on just about anybody's style um give us a little bit of help there practically how would somebody go about looking at their finances pulling the checkbook out and figuring out how in the world to carve 20 percent out so Great. That is a $64,000 question. So I know people who, you know, make $64,000 a year. I know people who make, you know, $640,000 a year. And it, most of the time, they're spending everything they earn, mm -hmm. right? And either one. And you kind of wonder, how is it that you guys are spending? So the answer to your question is, you just have to decide to do it. Huh. Budget, you know, there's a, a great study by uh, I mean, many people, but there, a great guy named Sean Ank Aker. Mm -hmm. Aker. He's, he was a guest on my radio show on Goldstein on Gelt. Uh, he's a professor, I think, at Harvard in the Divinity School, and he talks about happiness. And they discovered that people who, bait, who earn something like $70,000 a year, um, anything from $70,000 a year and up, mm -hmm. there's no difference in the amount of happiness. Meaning mm -hmm. we tell you money can't buy happiness, which I, I believe. But if you're broke, you're really, really broke, 
So I, you know, sure. then I, things are, are tough. But once you kind of make it basically, I don't mean to be a millionaire. I mean, you just have a, a, a decent salary. You're not going to be any more or less happy than a guy who's earning 10 times what you're earning. Wow. However, if you, the, the amount you spend is totally up to you. That's something you can control mm -hmm. and just decide that you're going to, first you got to pay your taxes, mm -hmm. then you pay your 20% to charity, and then you start all the other stuff like savings and uh, mm -hmm. food. That's really amazing. That's a great challenge. I like the challenge. Changes, change. Say that last line again, change is what? And you are, and it builds your character, and, you know. Mm -hmm. Change the behavior uh, and it builds your character, yeah. And uh, as my father once said to me, and it, this sort of relates here, he said, uh, you know, he, when, he, I was working pretty hard. He says, you know, make sure you go, go home for dinner because he said he never met, my father was a doctor. He said, I never spoke to someone on his deathbed who said, oh, I wish I spent more time at the office. <laughs> and in the same way, I've never met anyone who said, I wish I gave less charity. You are so on the mark. Doug, I love it. Great, great advice on sharing hope. Not just financial hope, but the hope that actually comes through that. So, Doug, the last question, which is not one of the five that we ask, I love asking this, is when you're in a funk and you need something fun to listen to on the way home, putting the iPod in, whatever, what are you going to listen to? What music? Well, I <laughs> <laughs> What music? Well, listen, I'm kind of an old jazz fan. I'll also oh, often yeah. listen to uh, to Duke Ellington. Kind of cheers me up, and uh, yeah. actually that and and a few years ago, I I even wrote some music on my own, and I like listening even no to my own. No way, stuff. really. But, uh, didn't make platinum. Did you publish it? Platinum. Yeah, we published a few hundred CDs, and most of them gave them out. But the, the fun part was just doing it. Though. Absolutely. So, Okay, so uh, that's really fantastic. I'd love to hear it sometime. The one you mentioned before, Duke Wellington. Any particular track? Duke Wellington. I, my favorite song is Satin Doll. Satin Doll, Duke Yellington. Ellington. 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 Excuse me, Duke Ellington. Okay. I'm not a jazz follower, but I will be no now. Problem. All right. That's great. All right, man. Doug, thank you for your time. Doug Goldstein is, again, an author, a financial advisor, a podcaster on New and Noteworthy section right now. And he is quite accomplished and been very gracious to let us have his time. So, Doug, if we want to find out more about you, about your book, Rich as a King, or your other projects, how can we find you and keep up with you? Chris, I really appreciate that. I had a great time being on the show. The, uh, the best way to find out about the book is we have the, the world's greatest uh, URL for the book, which is richasaking.com, wow. which is the title of the book. Our Twitter handle is at richasaking, and I'd be honored if people would reach out to me there at the Contact Us page of Rich as a King. I'd be, uh, I'd be thrilled if people would check out the book and, uh, and say hello. Wonderful. I'm sure we will. I'll put a lot of this in the show notes on our website as well so people can find you really quickly. Doug, thanks again. Enjoy Chris, the time. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. All righty. Doug, so amazing. Great job. Thank One you. of the yeah, best interviews too. we've had. I've uh, yeah. talked to uh, really good folks so far that are not afraid of the microphone, and you're very concise. Your stories are clear, and you are saving me a lot of editing time. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get to New and Noteworthy? So uh, the fact I'm going to refer, you know, I'm going to refer back to John Lee Dumas. I listen to a lot of his stuff. Yeah, if he's you good. Wanna, I, I think it's great. I listened but, to your yeah. I listened to your uh, episode with him. It was fantastic. Oh, thanks. And the schedule once uh, you didn't get oh to be the God. beneficiary of that through me, but I will uh, be using it from this point forward because it's so easy. Unbelievable! Yeah. Changed my life. I know. It, yeah, that's ten hours I, a week right there. I bet. For sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Just booking things that way. Um, All right. So, um, what's uh, uh, how are you getting to do a noteworthy? How did you uh, make that leap? Says, I just I someone I just heard a great talk. Hold on, I just gotta remember who said it. it might have been Tony Robbins. Um, you know, guys like you and me, we're always trying to think about scalability. Well, mm -hmm. I can do one. I can talk to one person. Or I could talk to ten thousand. You know, if right. I do a podcast. So he said, "Don't get so hung up on that." And this was like a radical thought for me. He said, don't get so hung up on the scalability, because it's true, and I try to scale all my stuff. He says, but sure. the benefit of being small is you can literally go and like talk to someone and say, hey, could you listen to my podcast? Or uh, he gave the example, Pinterest, which is like the social yeah. media with pictures, Absolutely. which I'm not, I'm not on, but I, I get it. My wife is. 
Yeah. Oh, so he said that the guy he founded that, like, he got it all set up, then he just walked down the street and ran into people and said, hey, check out my new social media thing. And, uh, you know, give it a shot. And, like, he literally spoke to one person at a time. So I did a lot of that. I just spoke to all my friends and my clients and wow. any... And my my gardener I said, "Hey, yeah. do, do you have an iPhone? Check this out." And you know, this thing it just built up. You don't need to have a million people to download it. Uh, you just have to, you know, start with one and then get to ten and fifty. And I, I don't even know how. No one knows their algorithms are secret. How yeah. they decide it gets there. And I didn't even know my my producer, my engineer. She said, "Hey, Doug, you're on New and Noteworthy." I said, "No way!" And then she sent me a screenshot. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Good for you. Okay, uh, last thing from an audio standpoint for you is. Say I, your name, Doug. share hope, and however you want to put that in there, Doug or Douglas, whatever you like. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed yeah, to say you. You say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll let you. You'll be introducing your own um, podcast, in essence. Got it. <clears throat> I, Doug Goldstein, share hope. Now I'll do one that says I am Doug Goldstein, and I share hope. <clears throat> I am Doug Goldstein, and I share hope. That's great. Thanks. All right, if you want no, to hear... You should, by the way, yeah, I want to give you one suggestion. Yeah. There's, someone did it. Oh, this guy with a new noteworthy post podcast, which I think is such a good idea. I never did this, but I regret it, and so now I'll tell you since you're still early. He got all of his cool guests to say, like what you're doing, but he said uh, uh, he would like use them for other podcasts. Like, uh, you're listening to the I Share Hope podcast. Hi, I'm Doug Goldstein. I'm a fan of I Share Hope, and Enjoy the show. You know, something like that. And then you, because yeah. when, when my interview was on the new and noteworthy, John Lee Dumas was the one, like, just because he had that as, he says, You're, this is John Lee Dumas listening to the new and noteworthy podcast. Enjoy. And I was like, that's so cool. Oh, I think it's a great, great idea. idea. Yeah, I wish I had done that. I wish I had done that a, a while back, but I've got to ask a question. But I've got, <laughs> so uh, sorry. I've still, I've still got well over 900 to go. So. <laughs> You're doing right, awesome. That's a fantastic idea. I'll use, in fact, can I use, uh, can I use your idea there? That's great. Yeah. All right. You've already already said some good stuff there and your good audio. I'll, I'll take your clip too. Um, okay. So who do you want to hear from? If you're tuning into the podcast right after you, who would you want to hear this content targeting? Who, who's the, uh, who's the interviewee? Anybody in the I'm, world? Nobody's yeah, told well, me no yet. And I've called <laughs> some crazy big people and you're one of them. And I'm surprised you've said yes as well. Well, I know that you spoke to my friend Jay Myers, which is who hooked us up, and he's awesome. He is a great guy. Um, uh, two guys come to mind would be either the um, the publisher that both Jay and I had published our books. Yeah. His name is uh, David Hancock. Okay. And the second one would be my co-author, Susan Polgar. Her story is great. She's, she's, yeah. You heard her on Entrepreneur on Fire. She's like, I love hearing her talk. She's just got all these good ideas. I love that. Can you connect me to both of those somehow? How would I get in touch with either one of them? I I will connect you, and I'm glad you asked. I like that. I would love to. It may be an email introduction or a phone call, however you think is best. I will do that. Hold on one second. Let me write it down so I don't actually forget. That'd be great. Thank you. I would love to interview Susan. She sounds like a fascinating person. Yeah, she's awesome. Hold on. Oh, God. How did you meet her? Did she tutor your kids or something? No, no. I, actually, my, uh, just like you do, you know, saying no one, no one ever says no. That's the fear everyone believes. Oh no, my God, I can't ask them to be on my show. They'll say no. Chris, hold on one second. With Susan and David and Cock. Yeah, they're both cool. Yes, yeah, so also big. Susan has a big foundation also, which uh, has given millions of dollars to uh, to charity to help kids. Like you know, a lot of kids in in the chess. You know, a lot of kids in a really bad way, they get involved in chess if they're lucky, and it, it totally brings them out. Like they hmm. build self confidence and strategy and tactics, and it's like it's you don't have to be a good chess player; you just have to be involved, and it yeah. really changes who you are. And um, so she's she's been responsible for literally millions of dollars going to that. That's fantastic. And David Hancock, our publisher, um, is the company is called uh, Morgan James Publishing. He just he gives he gives ten percent charity for all the books. And they put a little you know this thing called Habitat for uh, something for Habitat. It helps I think homeless. A habitat for Humanity. Yes, habitat they build for they build houses. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, so I, sorry, I'm just ten thousand miles away. So I don't I don't know that one. But, <laughs> but he puts that on every book uh, except ours because ours the charity for our book went to Susan's. Uh, Obviously, foundation. yeah. But. Um, but uh, it's cool. Like he's really into great idea. 
Yeah. Simple so idea. I'll, I'll try to hook you up with these guys. Please do. Doug, great to talk to you. When are you in the States next time? You come for any conferences or visits? Yeah, I'm coming next week to New York, yeah. No way. Yeah, I, I come a lot. I travel around a lot. Well, if you ever wander through Memphis... I, I, know. I know a lot of people there. I think I, I should try that. Listen, actually, well, if you hear, Susan and I are on a lecture tour now. We're speaking at conferences, so yeah. if you have any ideas... Yeah, I mean, these are, you know, four... This is how we're kind of making the money that we lost on writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what are you targeting? What's your ideal conference to go to? Business strategy, finance, uh, chess? I well, mean, it's definitely in the business world. Okay. The chess world... Uh, it, Maybe, and it's a little different because she's she is already in that world, so yeah. in other words, that, that wouldn't be about the book. But, um, you know, certainly, you know, a lot of organizations look for kind of inspirational speakers mm -hmm. and, uh, say, you know, sales training. And, yeah. I mean, you've been in the field, right? Absolutely. So, uh, this kind of thing is, is, is where we are now. The right. last speech we gave in Switzerland, she was, she gave her inspirational talk, and I, I kind of gave a way to, uh, to help. I was, we were speaking to, well, you'll, you'll understand. I didn't want to talk about it much on the air. It wasn't yeah. relevant. But the conference was money, 100 money managers and 100, um, uh, 100 money managers and 100 family offices, like yep. super high net worth family offices. Mm -hmm. And they brought them together. And uh, so I spoke about uh, behavioral finance and how people tend to miss what's right in front of them. Because that applied to sort of both, uh, both. So it was a, it was very exciting. We were sort of the highlight, and then Susan played a big simultaneous game against, against ten of the money managers who thought they were all smart. It was a lot. Of fun. It was ten on one, ten against one, ten against one. You know, each played ten games, and you know, and well, wiped them all out. That's but fantastic. It's fun to watch. It really humili you know, humiliates people in a good way. You know, they go, oh, wow, well, not as smart as I thought it was. Incredible. Well, I'd love to talk to her. Um, okay, I'll keep my ears open. We do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We broker dealer through LPL Financial, and uh, they're large here. I don't know how big they are overseas. I know they have a lot of offices no, overseas. No, they're. They're well, just US? US? I think they're pretty much US. They've, they were a little bit uh, cold. Gave us, we, I negotiated with them about, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. They were a little cold about overseas. Really? Even though, I mean, all my, my clients are all Americans, but yeah, they just live seriously. out in the United States. It's because it, the Patriot Act is really complicated. Yeah, a lot of complexity in the compliance work, I bet. So this is all we do, so it, therefore it's not a big deal for us. But I understand the bigger companies. Don't yeah, we? I understand that too. Well, anyway, if you're on the U.S. side, if they can get into uh, the conference scene, they do a lot of conferences. Them, uh, We also go to quite a few Morningstar conferences. Um, I'll let my if business you, partner know. I'll mention this to you him. Know, if you need someone who could just help us out, I'd really appreciate it because, it, you know, it's, it's all handshake kind of stuff. Well, we're one of the leading fee-only financial firms in the LPL system. We do a lot, and we do it very exclusively. So um, I will mention that because they're constantly calling us to have us speak and do breakouts and things like that. So I'll mention that we've talked, and it'd be a phenomenal story to follow. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Good luck. I'll, uh, uh, I'll send Great you some. I'll forward. send you some things. To, uh, once this thing launches, once we're ready to go, I'll send you an email, links, et cetera, et cetera. You connect me to those yeah, folks we'll there. Some key stuff too. Don't worry, we'll take okay. care of you. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, nice talking. Thanks, take care. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top ten actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.